you right now. Yeah. And in order for me to do that, I'm going to crunch 1,400 years of history in five minutes and make it as exciting as possible. <laughs> because I hated history when I was growing up. But those who don't learn from history are <laughs> doomed to repeat it. Oh, I'm talking to a smart group. In order for us to defeat radical Islam, we need to understand what is the ideology. Prophet Muhammad supposedly got his revelation from the angel Gabriel in the early 600s that he is supposed to be the last of the prophets. So he started preaching in his own city Mecca, telling them about his new religion. And he tried and he tried and he tried for 12 years and failed to recruit any followers except for his immediate family and close friends. So finally he decided after 12 years, forget my people, I'm going to go to the Jews in Medina. And the Jews in Medina, Medina was a Jewish business hub, the Jewish business center of Arabia at the time. And he said, I'm going to go to Medina and preach my religion to the Jews. Because if the Jews accept me, that will give me stature and respect in the eyes of my own people. And in order for Muhammad to sell his religion to the Jews, to make it more palpable to them, to accept him, he borrowed a lot from the Old Testament and incorporated it into his new religion, Islam. This is why you see a lot of similarities between Judaism and Islam. For example, Jews don't eat pigs, Muslims don't eat pigs. Jews pray a few times a day, Muslims pray a few times a day. Jews fast on Yom Kippur, Muslims fast on Ramadan. Religious Jews wash their hands before, before meals, you know, for prayers, Muslims do the same thing. So Muhammad packaged this whole new package deal about the people of the book and the people of the book and went to Medina and started preaching to the Jews. And after he tried, the Jews said, no, thank you. We like our religion. We, you know, we accept you. You're a nice guy. We welcomed you as our guest in our city. But thank you so much. We, we are very happy being Jewish and we do not want to become Muslims. We do not want to accept you. And that's when Prophet Muhammad became a military warrior and declared war against them. That's when Islam changed from being a spiritual movement in the first 12 years of Islam into becoming a political movement cloaked in religion. This is why when the Muslims celebrate the new year, just like every, like the Chinese have the new years, the Jews have the new years, you know, the Muslims have the new year. Their new year is based on the year of the Hijrah, the year Muhammad went to Medina and Islam became a political movement cloaked in religion. They don't consider the new year, they don't celebrate the new year based on when Muhammad got his revelation from the angel Gabriel. It's when Muhammad became a military warrior. And the political birth of Islam, that's the Islamic new year. When, when the Jews refused to accept Muhammad, he turned against them. He started expelling them out of their homes. He started taking their goods. Jews and Christians became dimmi under Islam, second-class citizens. Jews were not allowed to blow the shofar. They were not allowed to build temples. They were not allowed to pray publicly. Jews were not allowed to ride horses. They could only ride uh, donkeys. Jews became nejus. Nejus is the Arabic word for filth bodily fluid, dogs, all these things that are supposedly cursed by Allah. And Jews and Christians, Christians could not ring church bells, Christians could not pray publicly, they could not build churches. So, and the way they paid the jizya or the protection tax was by a monthly ceremony where the Jew or the Christian would kneel on his knees publicly and hand his goods to the mullah, whatever those goods were, happened to be at that time. And in many areas, Jews and Christians were given a receipt to wear around their neck as a necklace to show that they paid or they bought their protection, the jizya, the protection tax. As a matter of fact, Islam came up with identifiable clothing for the Jews. The yellow star, which most people think is a German invention, the yellow star is an Islamic invention by the second Khalif, the Khalif al-Mutawakkil in Iraq, who came up with the yellow Jew a star for the Jews to identify the Jews as they walked down the street. Because in that part of the world, everybody looks the same. 
For the Christians, they came up with the zunar, the belt that all of you men are wearing around your pants. That's called the zunar in Arabic. That was what they came up with to identify the Christians as they walked down the street. This became the faith of the Jews and the Christians under Islam. Islam continued to grow out of Arabia. They went all the way to Jerusalem. They conquered Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, Christians could not ring church bells. In the place of the birth of Christ, the city of Christ, Christians could not ring church bells. Christians could not pray publicly. Christians could not build churches. That's when the Pope in Rome in 1090 looked at the Christians in Europe and said, you need to rise and go defend the Christians and liberate them from the grip of Islam in Jerusalem. That's why the Crusaders were launched in 1090. The Crusaders went to Jerusalem and fought the Muslims and they were able to liberate the city, but liberated it for less than 80 years. Before 100 years, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, Saladin, recaptured the city, took it back, and Jerusalem remained under Islamic control until the year 1967, when the State of Israel liberated Jerusalem from the Islamic grip of the Jewish Christians and Muslims. The Crusaders continued fighting the Muslims. But the Crusaders could not win against Islam because Islam was so powerful. The Crusaders fought for 300 years and finally by the 1300s completely dissipated, gave up and disappeared because they could not defeat Islam. Islam continued to grow. They went all the way into Spain. They went all the way into Central China. They went all the way into Central Europe. They conquered India. And as they expanded, they changed the names of the cities. Spain became Andalusia. Jerusalem, Jerusalem became Al-Quds. But what's the best way to strip a society out of its identity? Strip it of its language, strip it of its names and give it a new identity and that's exactly what they did. And as they expanded, people that they conquered who were not Christians and Jews, they protected people of the book. They were given only two choices, either convert or die. And this is why Islam was responsible for the murder of 70 million Hindus in India. 70 million who refused to convert to Islam. Islam continued to expand. By the 1600s, Islam covered more of the earth's surface than the, than the Roman Empire did at its peak. Let me repeat. Islam covered most, more of the earth's surface than the Roman Empire did at its peak. And the Roman Empire was pretty big. This is how powerful the Islamic State or the Islamic Caliphate had become. Between the 1600s and the 1800s, the Europeans were experiencing their European revolution. This is how they figured out how to make products on factory lines and produce products so fast that they can sell in the market, which brought money so fast into the European armies. And that's how they were able to build their armies and, 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 and grow and strengthen and build weaponry. And this is how the Europeans were able to stop the Muslims at the gates of Vienna on 9-11. The date 9-11 is so symbolic in the Islamic calendar, that's exactly why Osama bin Laden chose to attack America on 9-11. Because on 9-11, the armies of Europe, the Christian armies defeated Islam. And right now, America is the pinnacle of Christendom in the eyes of the Islamists worldwide. Because America is the superpower of the Judeo-Christian value system and of the Western world, Western civilization. The Europeans stopped them at the gates of Vienna and then they started kicking them out, out of cities, out of towns, out of countries and they kicked the Muslims all the way into North Africa and the Middle East and that's why you see the concentration of Muslims in North Africa and the Middle East. And the Islamic Caliphate or the Islamic Empire or the Islamic State ended in 1924 in Turkey by President Ataturk, less than 100 years ago. By the time the Islamic Empire ended, the Islamic State ended, it had ruled for 1,400 years and killed in the process 270 million people killed by the sword. Because remember, back then there was no weapons of mass destruction. There was no biological weapons. How many of you knew this history? Raise your hand. 
Oh, you're a good act for America members. Okay, good education. Where's Dan? Good education, Dan. Good for you. I'm Beverly and everybody else. Good. Usually when I ask this question, when I'm speaking to the public, you know, you see these little hands kind of, you know, shaking, not sure. You have to finally mix it up. Shaking because they are really not sure how much they knew. It is shocking. But you see, we have very little knowledge of history outside of this group. Very little knowledge of history. We don't teach history. Our enemy knows their history. We don't know our history. Right now, our president, you know, right now you talk to a teenager. You ask them, tell me about World War II. They look at you with their eyes crossed. World War II, for them, that's ancient history. <coughs> this is how ignorant we are of history. And you hear people talk about, all oh, the Islamic State, as if it's a new phenomenon. The Islamic State ended less than a hundred years ago. What the Muslims did is just re-establish the Islamic Caliphate. What's new? They feel it is their right. As a matter of fact, after the Islamic State ended in 1924 by President Ataturk, a group of Muslims in Egypt got together and they said, how can Christendom win over Islam? I mean, Islam is superior to all other religions. Muslims are superior to all other people. Therefore, we need to organize, re-strengthen, and re-establish the caliphate. And they started organizing. The Muslim Brotherhood, the Akhwan al-Muslimin, started in Egypt in 1928. And today, the Muslim Brotherhood has 70 offshoot Islamic organizations, including Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and ISIS. Remember, al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, was in our prisons in 2011 as a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is the same al-Baghdadi who re-established the Islamic State. The Islamic State that President Obama tells us, and he insists, it's not Islamic, it has nothing to do with Islam. Because President Obama knows better than al-Baghdadi, the head, the Khalif, the head of ISIS, who has a PhD in Islamic theology out of the University of Baghdad, no less. <laughs> So, Al-Baghdadi with a PhD in Islamic theology, and by the way, was one of the most stellar students at the university. He was very well known in Iraq. <coughs> but our President Obama knows better about the religion. They're nothing but a JV team, and they are not Islamic. I swear to God, he knows it. That's the truth, and that he is convinced that's the truth. While the world laughs at us. Why should we be concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood? In the 30s and 40s and 50s, a lot of scholars in the, Islamic, in, in the Western world thought the Islamic State is over. The Islamic State will never be resurrected. Islam is finished. They don't have the resources. They don't have the power. They don't have uh, the intellectual ability to invent things. I mean, after all, what have you seen come out of the Islamic world in the last 400 years? In areas of copyrighted great ideas or Nobel Prize winners or whatever. So a lot of scholars in the West thought Islam was over. But two things happened in the Middle East that gave the Islamists the money and the power to explode on the world stage. Oil. 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 The discovery of oil, which we discovered in the 60s, and the Saudis were able to nationalize it. We were stupid enough to let them nationalize it. That gave them the money to spread their radical ideology worldwide. The Saudis have spent over $70 billion building mosques and Islamic madrasas worldwide. And the second thing that happened was Ayatollah Khomeini coming to power in 1979. That gave the Islamists the spiritual covering in order to move forward. So now they have the money, they have the blessing and the spiritual covering, and they exploded on the world stage. The Muslim Brotherhood wrote a plan in 1982, a 100-year plan for radical Islam to infiltrate and dominate the West and establish an Islamic government on Earth. In the counter-terrorism circles, this plan became known as the Project. What makes the Project so unique is it gives tactics and proposals as to how to infiltrate the West, how to use our laws against us, how to use our open-mindedness against us, how to use our multiculturalism against us. 
They talk about how to uh, start nonprofit organizations and human rights organizations and civil organizations and maintain the appearance of moderation in order to advance the radical Islamic agenda in the West. They talk about how to build community centers in the inner cities and use them as recruiting centers. They talk about how to get democratically elected Muslims on all levels in the West, including government, NGOs, etc. They talk about how to get Muslim interns on all in all governmental offices so they can have an insider view as to how policy is done on the highest levels. They talk about how to work with like-minded progressive organizations that share similar goals. For example, this is why when you see uh, CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, working with the ACLU, you scratch your head and you think to yourself, how can these two people work together? What do they have in common? But the ACLU is being used as a useful idiot at the hands of CARE, an organization with an agenda. They started implementing their plans in Europe. Remember, the plan started in 1982. In the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and now all the early 2000s, here we are, 2016. Europe has morphed from Europe to Arabia. Europe is no longer the place you used to go visit. And I visited there two years ago, before ISIS was what it is, and before the crisis now of the immigration. Two years ago, I was on a cruise ship in Marseille, and they told us specific instructions. You can get out of the port, and you can only walk these two blocks. Do not get out of there, it's very dangerous. The Islamists are there, and there is murder, there is rape. If you cross over those blocks, we do not guarantee your safety. They told us not to take any money with us, except for credit cards, that we can use only on that strip of Marseille, and that's it. I couldn't believe my eyes. I had actually an Imam terrorist in the cabin next to me who didn't know I was in the cabin and I'm sitting reading my book on the balcony and they were sitting plotting next to me how they're going to bomb Spain. So of course I go down to the security who happen to be all Israelis by the way in case you do not know all security on cruise ships are Israelis. <laughs> and I have to stop here. And I told them I was just sitting next uh, and next to my cabin there is this terrorist who happens to be a doctor from Egypt who was next to me. That's a whole other story. Do not let me digress. Um, but this is how Europe is gone. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, there are 85 Sharia courts operating in Britain right now, parallel to British courts. Right now. In France alone, they have 725 no-go zones. 725. This is the little dirty secret that nobody wants to talk about. And you wonder what France is all of a sudden shocked. Why do they have such an Islamic problem and how can they pull such terrorist attacks? That's why. But what we are seeing in Europe right now is a preview as to what's coming to the United States. Because they are moving forward with their plan much faster than, we, than what we had anticipated. Because, remember, they wrote a 100-year plan for radical Islam to infiltrate and dominate the West and establish an Islamic government on earth. They already established an Islamic government. They didn't need to wait 100 years. They established it within 30 years after writing the plan. Europe is already infiltrated and almost dominated. Gone. Europe is one minute to midnight. Europe is dying. America is the last man standing. So why should we be concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood in America? Because they wrote the plan for the destruction of the United States in 1991. Here is the plan. The plan is titled مذكرة تفسيرية للهدف الاستراتيجي العام للجماعة في أمريكا الشمالية. Yes, I do speak Arabic and I do read Arabic. The title in English is an explanatory memorandum on the general strategic goal for the group in North America written in 5-22-1991. This document was presented as evidence in the largest terrorism trial ever in the history of the United States, where our government sued the Holy Land Foundation, one of the largest Islamic charities in America, for raising millions of dollars in America 
to and sending it overseas to support terrorism. Our government handed down 108 guilty verdicts to Muslim Americans and Muslim American organizations um, who are involved raising money here in the United States and sending it overseas. And by the way, did you know that the average amount they raised was $160, which is the price for a suicide belt for a suicide bomber to blow himself up? Millions raised in the United States. So that's the plan for the United States. And I'm just going to read you one paragraph out of the plan that will give you a pretty good idea of their intentions and what they are thinking. When I said to you that they don't mince words, that they don't beat around the bush, as I'm reading these words, I want you to remember my words. The title of this paragraph is Understanding the Role of the Muslim Brother in North America. The process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. The Ikhwan, which is the Arabic word for brothers, must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands, meaning us, by their hands and the hands of the believers, the believers meaning the Ikhwan or the Muslim Brotherhood, so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Do they mean swords? Can they get any clearer than this? And our government knows this, by the way. This is no news to them. But the most important page about this document is the last page. Because the last page lists 29 front Islamic organizations set up in the United States for the sole purpose of destroying our country from within. And notice when I'm going to start reading them to you, I'm not talking about ISIS and those who want to blow us up militarily. We, we know that, that there is that element of it. But this is a civilization jihad. Remember what they said, a civilization jihad, meaning a cultural jihad? This is the cultural war that they are raging against us. And here are the names of the organizations involved. ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. Now, if some of you are familiar with that name, it's because they are advisors to President Obama about Middle East policy. It was actually the president of ISNA who wrote President Obama's speech, the first famous speech he delivered to the Arabic world in Egypt. The president of ISNA wrote that speech. So we not only have the fox watching the hen house, we have the fox inside the White House talking policy in the ear of the president. Number two on the list is the MSA, the Muslim Student Association. The Muslim Student Association has more chapters on American college campuses than the Democrats and the Republicans combined. And we wonder why we're losing our universities. Number eight on the list is Nate, the North American Islamic Trust, which owns the deed to over 90% of mosques in the United States. Number 22 on the list is IAP, the Islamic Association for Palestine, which later became CARE, the Council on American-Islamic Relations, which is a terror front for the terrorist organization Hamas set up right here in the United States. And I'm going to focus at this point on what they're talking about in this plan. And as you can see, I just read you tidbits of this plan. In this plan, they go into details that will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up straight. And by the way, they wrote this plan in 1991. Over 20 years ago, they began implementing their plan in America. And they have an organization set up to attack us in every area of our society. Publishing, education, media, public relations, every single area of our society. But at this point, I want to focus on education. Because how do you change a culture? through education. And that's what I want to focus on in the latter part of my presentation. Education. Because of the Saudis and their oil, they started pumping millions of dollars into our universities, setting up Middle East study departments, and political science departments, and appointing Arab professors who are anti-Israel, anti-America, to teach our children that America is bad, Israel is evil, and the Islamic world is the underdog and the oppressed. 
And to give you an idea of the extent of the Saudi peddling that has taken care, that has taken hold of our universities, I'm going to share with you some numbers. The King of Saudi Arabia gave the University of Arkansas $20 million. $22 million was given to Harvard University from two Saudi sheikhs linked to Al-Qaeda. $28.1 million was given to Georgetown University to set up their Middle East Study Department by actually named after Prince Bandar bin Talal. Remember the prince that gave Giuliani the $10 million after 9-11 and Giuliani told him you can shove it where the sun doesn't shine? <laughs> that As a whole department in his name, $28.1 million at Georgetown University. And by the way, they call me an Islamophobe. $5 million given to MIT, $1.5 million to Texas A&M, $5 million to Rutgers University, $5 million to Columbia University. The list goes on. UC Santa Barbara, John Hopkins University, Duke University, American University, UCLA, Howard University. And I can go on and on and on and on. You get the idea. From the Ivy League to the community colleges and everything in between, Every time you pump gas in your car, remember, while you're pumping gas, they are pumping hatred and venom into our children's minds and our colleges and universities in America. And that's why we must become energy independent tomorrow. People ask me all the time, Brigitte, why is the media so biased? My gosh, God forbid you're watching CNN or CNN International if you are, you know, overseas. I don't know about you, but if you ever take a cruise or go overseas, watching CNN International, you might as well be watching ISIS television in English. <laughs> America is evil, Israel is evil, nobody can do anything good, we are so bad, we are oppressors, and the Islamic world is the underdog, and oh my gosh, we need to get with the program because all the rest of the world is nice and we are just evil. I tell people, why are you surprised? Because for the last 20 plus years, all these students graduating from our best universities have been fed a steady diet of hate and resentment against America. They are today the news anchors, the news writers, the news reporters, the policy makers, the foreign policy shapers. I mean, just look at our president. We don't have a commander in chief. We have an apologizer in chief who never misses an opportunity to apologize. The strategy worked so well on college campus that the Islamists decided, why wait until the kids get to college? Why don't we start with them in 6th and 7th grade in middle school and high school? This way, by the time they get to college, they are 18 years old and they vote, and we have them in the palm of our hands. So the Islam Project was launched in 1991 in California. And they started providing consultants to America's top publishers who publish so, uh, social studies books and history books to teach them about Islam. So the publishers started introducing a course about Islam to be taught in public school. And the course is a three-week course where students have to adopt Islam, memorize and recite verses from the Quran, adopt Islamic names, and fast for one day for Ramadan if they can, and go on a field trip to a, to a mosque to experience what it's like to be a Muslim. And when I started speaking about this after my second book, They Must Be Stopped, you know, people would say to me, oh, Brigitte, you're exaggerating. There is no possible way that, that this could be happening in our public schools. I mean, you know, we have separation of church and state. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I learned there is nothing like show and tell. This is the course that was introduced in 1991 in the state of California, later Texas, and then all over the nation, over 20 years ago. This course is called the Islam Course. It is put out by a company called Interact Publishing, based in California. And I'm going to just read you some little tips, just little quotes from this course, so you can see what little Michael and Sarah are studying in our public school. So this is a teacher instruction, by the way, course. And uh, I got this course because it was presented as evidence 
by the Thomas More Law Center when they sued the Excelsior School in Byron, California for indoctrinating the children into religion. And this is the course that they admitted as evidence in their trial. So this is strictly for the teachers. If you call the school, you can even get a course like this because it's only for the teachers exclusive. But here's what the course says. The teacher starts her instructions or his instruction by saying, from the beginning, you and your classmates will become Muslims. You will be a member of a caravan. This is how the teacher starts the course to the students. Okay, you all, you're Muslims for the next three weeks. The teacher continues instructions by saying, dressing as a Muslim and trying to be involved will increase your learning and enjoyment. Finally, trying your best at all tasks will guarantee you an excellent grade and a more enjoyable time. So what is the teacher doing? Dangling the great carrot in front of the children. If you are so nice, you're gonna get good grades if you get with the program. Here is the page about all the Islamic names that they can choose from. They've got boys' names, girls' names. And here, oh, th this, is, this is the kicker. This is wisdom cards. These are cue cards for students to memorize their lesson. Just like in maths, you know, mathematics, you know, they have cue cards for kids to memorize the multiplication tables, etc. This is to memorize the Islam lesson. So this card in particular talks about jihad. And I want to share this card with you because usually when we hear the word jihad, you know, it's usually associated with terrorist activities or terrorism. I mean, after all, terrorists Call, terrorist organizations call themselves Islamic Jihad. How many of you have heard of the Islamic Jihad organization? Yeah. Yeah. Islamic Jihad, that's the name of a terrorist group. Jihad, the word Jihad is mentioned in the Quran 40 times. 36 times out of 40 as a holy war against the infidels to either kill them or subjugate them. But here's what little Michael and Sarah are studying in public school about Jihad. A jihad is a struggle by Muslims against oppression, invasion, and injustice. <laughs> now, if these words sound familiar to you, it's because these are the talking points of Al-Qaeda. These are the talking points of Islamists. Anytime Al-Qaeda used to issue press release, video press release, remember those days by Osama bin Laden, to tell America why they hate us? What do they say they hate us for? They are fighting oppression. They are fighting invasion. They are fighting injustice. They want us out of Arab land. We are unjust and evil and big and colonial. They were fighting oppression. We were oppressing the poor Muslim world. Anytime you hear a suicide bomber, a Palestinian suicide bomber, issue his last video before he blows himself up, he says he is dying because he is fighting oppression and he is fighting injustice and he is fighting occupation and he is fighting um, oppression and injustice and, uh, and invasion. So what, what's happening right now is we are teaching the talking points of our enemies to our children in public school in 6th and 7th grade paid for by our tax dollars. And this has been happening for over 20 years. You wonder why we have a problem with anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism? Now, this started over 20 years ago. That means the kids that were studying this stuff now are their 30s. You wonder why they hate Israel and they resent America and our troops and us being in the Middle East? Because we're the evil ones. And when the troops are returning, those lefties are saying, well, of course they hate you. Because you're there, you're occupying their land, you are so unjust to these poor Muslims. Of course they hate you, they just want you out, just get out and everything will be fine. You know, Hitler made a very important statement. Hitler said, give me the children, I will change society in 10 years. And that's exactly what he did. And this is why today, when you look at our society, and you see a socialist running for president, and you see America haters running for president, and you see all the support that they have, and you think to yourself, how can these people have such support? It's because we have a new generation who are embarrassed of America, who do not like America, who are not proud of America, who do not think America is exceptional, who know our allies, especially the state of Israel, because they have been fed a steady diet of hate and resentment, not only in college, but it's also in our middle and high schools. And it's been happening for years. 
while well, Americans have been asleep at the switch. You know why? Because our kids come home from school, mommy's cooking dinner, Michael and Sarah are sitting at the table doing their homework, mommy looks at Michael and says, Mikey, honey, how are you doing with your homework? You can't go out and play until you're done with your homework. And Mikey finishes home and he says, mommy, I'm done, can I go out and play now? And mommy said, sure, honey, go. Mommy didn't see what Michael was studying or what homework he was doing from school. And speaking of homework, I have got to use this um, homework example for you. So they give them homework assignment, right? Here's a homework assignment for you. Become a Muslim warrior during the Crusades or during an ancient jihad. Explain weapons, tactics, etc. That's homework. This is the course. I mean, you know what? You would think I'm making this stuff up. But this is how little we knew what was happening in our public schools. You want to know what they're teaching? Talking about separation of church and religion? Here's another important segment because we have a lot of pastors here, I heard. So I've got to share this piece. The children are asked to memorize and recite verses from the Quran. They are asked to recite the Shahada or the Islamic prayer, which is the Islamic salvation. This is how you convert to Islam. It's the equivalent of the salvation prayer in English. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and I give my heart to Jesus and my life to Jesus, etc. Here's what Johnny and Sally are reciting in public schools. <coughs> Praise be to Allah, Lord of creation, the compassionate, the merciful, King of judgment day. You alone we worship and to you alone we pray. Did I mention this is public schools? Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not of those who have gone, who have incurred your wrath, which is the Jews nor of those who have gone astray, which is the Christians. This is utter nonsense, Amen. and this is exactly what's happening in our public school system. By the way, this course is no longer taught like this. Right now, this course is weaved into our textbooks, into our social studies and history books, Actually, the students cannot pass 22 questions of the SOL exam on hour of this course. 22 questions for the kids to pass their exam are out of this course. This is how this has been weaved into our school system. This is what we are dealing with as a nation right now. This is the stuff that nobody wants to talk about because nobody wants to offend anybody. Everybody's walking on eggshells. Well, I say this is the time we take political correctness and throw it in the garbage. People from all background, 
People from all religions, black, white, blonde, male, black, you name it, all here. This is what makes America wonderful. We all came together to become American. And I am sick and tired when I hear people say, I'm an African American, and I'm a Spanish American, and I'm a Vietnamese American, and I'm Italian American, and I'm an Irish American. I am nothing but an American. family is all about. Amen. We Amen. are one. People who put their differences aside and came together because we love this country. We want to preserve this country. We want to make sure this country continues to be the greatest nation on the face of the planet. And while I'm on a roll, I believe English is the official language of the world. We all know we have a problem in our country. As a matter of fact, we all know so much that we have a problem in our country that both the Republicans and Democrats in this nation acknowledge we have a problem that needs to be fixed. And that's why they're going out of the usual to get somebody that can fix the problem or somebody that they believe can fix the problem. This election is an election about survival. It's about the survival of the United States. It's about the survival of Western civilization. Because America is the superpower of Western civilization. This is why I hope every single one of you goes out and votes this election. Your life and your children's life will on. 9-11 was a defining moment for the United States. 9-11 was especially a defining moment for me. You see, we all on 9-11 did the same thing. We all sat around watching our TV screens, feeling so frustrated, watching the images of the World Trade Center tumble down again and again and again, feeling brokenhearted, feeling helpless, feeling sad, feeling angry, feeling, how can somebody do such a thing to us? How can, how can murderers be so bloody that they would use, hijack planes and use them, uh, you know, as missiles into, human missiles into skyscrapers? We couldn't believe somebody would do this to us. That day, my two young daughters came home from school that afternoon. And my youngest daughter, who was around my age, when I was wounded in Lebanon, looked at me and she said, Mommy, why did they do this to us? And I found myself looking into her eyes and repeating to her exactly what my daddy said to me. They hate us because they consider us infidels and they want to kill us. Here we were, two generations apart, two continents apart. I was a young Lebanese girl, she's a young American girl. I spoke Arabic, she speaks English. 8,000 miles apart, 30 years apart. And I found myself repeating to my daughter exactly what my father said to me. That day was my defining moment. That day I vowed that I will do everything I can to make sure that my daughter will never ever look into her child's eyes and repeat to him or to her what my daddy said to me and what I had to say to her. That day I was reborn as an activist. September 11th happened on a Tuesday morning until Sunday, unable to move. I was in shock, flashback, absolutely miserable, remembering my own experience, thinking, what can I do to make a difference? And finally, I, I decided, I'm going to start a nonprofit organization called ACT, and I'm going to travel nationwide, and I'm going to educate millions of Americans about the threat of radical Islam to world peace and our national security. And I started traveling, and I started speaking, and I incorporated ACT in 2002, in July. 
And I started traveling and I started speaking. And in my first year, I gave 143 presentations in the state of Virginia alone. And I started traveling nationwide. And I realized very quickly that you can educate until the cows come home. Nothing is going to change. I would speak to groups from as small as eight people meeting at Frankie's Ribs at six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. Who meets at seven o'clock in the morning? <laughs> to groups of 10,000 in some of those mega churches. And one question always kept popping up. Now that I'm educated, what can I do? Give me something to do. And I realized there has never been more education than we have now. You type in the word Islam in Google and you get 60,000 pages. I wrote two, two, two New York Times bestsellers on the subject. It's not that we are lacking education. It is that we are lacking what to do about the education that we know. People want something to do to make a difference. And that's when I launched our activism arm, our grassroots network in 2007. Act for America and launched our chapter. And today I'm proud to tell you that we have 1,000 chapters nationwide. And I wish all our chapter meetings would be like this. I wish all 1,000 would be like this. Unfortunately, they're not. But look at here tonight. This vision started out of laying on the couch in my family.